Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome to another episode of The Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Riaz. Um, this is that time of the week that you know I really, really enjoy because this, this is one of those programs that I get to, as I'm sure all the people who are watching, you get to forget about these sort of mundane things and the activities that we're going through the whole week. And this is a time to slow down, basically slow down and connect yourself again with the classics, with art, with literature, with music, all those things that really, really mean something to you. And uh, you know, they're really they're sort of like chicken soup for the soul. That's what I think this is. So uh, today we're going to talk about Russian literature. And in Russian literature, we're going to talk about uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky and his work, The Idiot. Uh, now, of course, uh, the title brings lots and lots of images to your mind, and it's very, very interesting, very intriguing. So to talk about today's uh, book, we, are, we have with us Fahim Sardar, author of three books himself, CEO and trainer. Thank you, Fahim, for yeah, joining us here today. Here. Thank you so much. OK, so, you know, today we, we're talking about this work, The Idiot. It's something that the title suggests many things, many images inside a person's <laughs> mind. And, um, you know, the minute you hear the title, you start relating things and sure. you start th making connections. Tell us about the journey uh, of Dostoevsky in reaching this, this work. Uh, and, you know, a bit of a bit about a background, about what it's about. Thank you. Um, in my uh, understanding of Dostoevsky, um, uh, people always quote uh, Crime and Punishment, which was his next book, as, as his, you know, one of, it is one of the most famous books, mm. if, if I'm not mistaken. But this is my personal favorite because I thought it was, was, this was more apt and more accurate to society mm -hmm. today. Mm. Um, Dostoevsky himself had a very turbulent life, and he himself, he never really enjoyed any of this fame. In, in financial terms, but he went through so much hell that that gave him the stability, the understanding of the human mind mm -hmm. to write such deep things. Now, um, what am I saying here? Uh, he left, I believe, uh, a job to become a writer, which at that time in Russia was its was not a very advisable thing to do. Mm. And he he had a gambling problem even till the time he died. Mm. He was a compulsive gambler, so he was always in debt somehow. So he those problems which are self-created, he was experiencing them pretty severely. But something very interesting happens that he writes a couple of books, he translates a couple of French books and stuff like that. But then suddenly he gets involved with what we're told is some political activity mm -hmm. and suddenly he's rounded up and thrown into uh, away in Sir, uh, Siberia and if that wasn't bad enough then his uh, orders for his execution come and he is arranged in front of a firing squad mm. with an open dug grave for him a mm. fresh grave and he's about to be killed mm. about to be executed not mm. killed and suddenly out of nowhere a reprieve comes which mm. says do not kill him and it's, uh, his sentence is commuted to four years hard labor in Siberia. Mm. He, his, uh, he, I think he already was an epileptic, but that's where things started to get very acute. And he survives by the skin of his teeth, uh, only to be thrown into hard labor in Siberia from where nothing escapes. Mm. But he survives those four years. And then he becomes so strong mentally that suddenly his works become uh, much deeper, mu much more philosophical and mm. much much more telling of the human realities, human nature, and human sensibilities. Mm. That's why we, uh, his, uh, this is like a lead up to his great works. I mean, I consider this to be his, one of his greatest works. Mm. Uh, who am I to question what was better, what was not? But mm. this leads him up to crime and punishment, which leads up to demons, and then that leads up to another book. And after that, it was the Brothers Karamazov, which was his magnum opus. He said, about Brothers Karamazov that uh, if I finish this book in my lifetime, I have expressed myself completely. And mm. I've read that book and it's, it's like a thousand pages long and it is, uh, every page has a history to it, mm. a depth to it. Mm. So that is a very brief summary of how, of his journey, mm. Dostoevsky's and journey, yeah. Right, and how he ended up writing that. Okay, you mentioned something there. Um, imagine the scene a person, a writer, because a writer is always somebody who's 
a highly sensitive person. True. Uh, anyway, or whoever, whatever a creative soul you are talking about, they have that extra sensory perception inside them. Imagine him staring into his grave. Yes. The phenomena of a person being a highly sensitive individual staring into one's grave. What sort of insights would have that? What, what sort of a jolt is that? Uh, I mean, adding to what you just said, a jolt inside. I mean, imagine this is Russia where the weather is so harsh and the people have seen the harshness of reality. Napoleon couldn't survive the weather. Hitler couldn't survive the weather. Those people know how to live in that harsh environment. So that makes you harsh. Mm. In that harshness, he gets a harsher treatment. Mm. So what happens to a person's sensitivity? He either survives or goes mad. Mm. Uh, his uh, companions, one or two of his companions at that time who were supposed to be executed and who were also reprieved, mm. they went mad. Mm. He didn't. Mm -hmm. So a, a sensitive person uh, has to protect himself, which incidentally, mm. well, the answer to your question is actually this book, mm. that what happens to a sensitive person who has, as you said, extra sensory perception, who, who is able to uh, perceive things, perceive at things level able, to, able to deconstruct and reconstruct. Mm. I mean, okay, I'm being very mechanical about it, but mm. you know, true artists can feel their environment. Course, so uh, how does a person who can feel his environment, which is very harsh and which is not very relenting, it doesn't relent, by the way, mm. how does he describe things in a sane manner? Dostoevsky, in, uh, and I'm sure people would back me up on this, he deals with human insanity Mm. and human sanity in the best possible way. And at his time, he, uh, I think many people would still consider him to be one of the best psychologists of the modern era, uh, given the fact that he has not read a sing he had never read a single line on psychology, mm. clinical psychology. But everything was his experiences, yeah, his absolutely. reaction to it, the deep insight into other people's behavior. Accurate insight, if I might just add. Mm. Accurate insight, because mm -hmm. he was so accurate about human nature. Mm. Because I, I, was, I would sort of juxtapose him with, you know, for the sake of an analysis, with Machiavelli. Machiavelli also had a very deep insight, but he had, a, he had, a, he had an evil bent. Mm. to what he was saying. Mm. But Dostoevsky gives a very holistic view about everything. He does mm. talk about evil very, very perfectly, almost as if he's, he was staring the devil in the face. Mm. But um, the, the collection of this, um, and sorry if I'm bringing my own personal opinion here, but mm. after having read Dostoevsky, very, a lot of famous authors, in my humble opinion, mm. started to pale in comparison. Right. Okay, there's nothing compared to this guy. Right. When this book came out, how was it received? It was received, I think, nominally, uh, positively, because crime and punishment was something that just went at that time, mm -hmm. because we're talking about the late 1800s, and mm -hmm. this was, came out in uh, sometime in the 1860, late 1860s, 1869 mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly. Um, Dostoevsky was famous, hmm. but crime and punishment made him very famous. Hmm. This book, I think, has been eclipsed by the fame of other books. Okay, uh, right. And so you would say that if the, this had been at a different timing, it may have gathered more of the spotlight that it deserved. I'm convinced about hmm. that, and hmm. I, think, um, I think you have the point, you've nailed the point. Um, I, I, because I can compare his other books. I've read Crime and Punishment, Brothers Karamazov, and uh, um, th this, I don't know, it just stands out to me. Mm. And it has actually been, you know, acknowledged by many experts to be one of his greatest works, whereas yeah. you have said it's Crime and Punishment that he's uh, remembered by, but this also has been critically acclaimed to be one of his gr yes, greatest novels as well. Yes, that is true, that is well. true. Okay, so the title, The Idiot. This is something that, I mean, it, it may seem for some people to be very specific, but it's not. It's about the human mind. It's about the way one should uh, behave as uh, opposed to uh, how they do behave in certain situations. Is this about a tussle between the heart and the mind and uh, crimes of passion and how to keep your emotions in check? What, what exactly is he dealing with? The I think here? he's dealing with all of those things and more at the same time. That's what makes him so uh, uh, amazing as a writer because um, uh, he is dealing, as you said, as he's dealing with, uh, you know, 
societies as they are, mm. as they should be, mm. as values are as they sh versus as they should be and mm. mind you he's questioning them mm. so we have to understand that he is writing these books I mean he was a live human being mm. he wrote stuff which questioned things mm. because he criticizes his own society where it needs to be criticized he appreciates it where it needs to be appreciated mm. and that did ruffle feathers so you can well imagine what this man is trying to do here mm. and uh, being, uh, let's just say, compelled by his own passions, mm. that's also a passion mm. to write something. He deals with all of these things in a, in a, in a very, very uh, harsh way, to be frank. Mm. Very frank, harsh, but uh, the beauty of Dostoevsky was that he takes you, he describes madness, takes you closer to it, and you're dreading it, you know, don't go further. He takes you inside the center of the beast, mm. the madness, mm. but then he brings you back out. That's the beauty. Which is amazing. Which is amazing. And, and there's a reason for because it. Because many authors will leave you there. Yeah, because, because it's, it's more tempting. It's easier to just scare people. Mm. And just you and know, leave that the, lasting impression. Yeah, exactly. It, and it's usually a, typically a very bad taste. Mm. But in this, um, in, in my opinion, uh, I could see the clear difference between French authors and him and the Russians. And I'm hardly an expert on Russian authors. But what I have realized is that they have a common thread. Uh, with Tolstoy, Chekhov, and of course Dostoevsky, they do talk about the madness of things, mm. a madness of the human mind. Mm. Because we, we tend to go crazy. I mean, let's face it. Mm. They say, firstly, we do go crazy. Mm. Others would sort of just you know, tiptoe around this topic. Mm. And they, they describe it. Mm. But they bring you back up. Mm. Absolutely. Um, talking about madness, I mean, again, madness is relative. Normalcy is relative uh, because, uh, you know, as I say, what, what's normal to the spider is chaos to the fly. Absolutely. So <laughs> it's all perception. Uh, madness to a certain degree. We fear it. We're in awe of it because it's just so powerful. And something abstract, something intangible. Yeah. To deal with that and to actually gain control of that. Isn't that one of the most powerful things that you can do? Indeed, and I mean only a powerful mind can do it. And we're talking about a powerful mind here. Dostoevsky mm. was a very powerful mind. He mm. was a very strong mind because uh, how many of us have seen the inside of a cell and been able to describe it in a, in a uh, negative as well as positive manner. Mm. So um, his, uh, his book, I think Notes from the Underground, was based on his experiences in mm. solitary confinement where, where people, he couldn't hear anything. People were, troop, uh, uh, the police was told to wear felt boots so that he could not hear anything. So it's like mm. a punishment not only of a, a solitary nature, it's a extreme punishment. Torture. It's extreme torture. Mm. He's been through that. Mm -hmm. But having said that, um, as you said, you're talking about madness and things like that. Um, what, we, uh, what we see, what we see is Many people try to grapple it, as you said. Mm. It's a very powerful thing to be able to handle it. Mm. This book very specifically describes that, as you said, normalcy. Mm. One is, uh, madness might not be normal for one and then it might be for someone mm. else. Actually, that's precisely the point of this book because mm. this person, this book called The Idiot, mm. is about a beautiful soul who beautiful ventures soul. into a yeah. society, who comes back after a, a health issue, mm. comes back into his own society, not mm. an alien society, mm. but that society is so alien to him mm. because he's of high intellect, he's got a good mind, he's got a good soul, he wants to help people. Mm. But he is an outsider, he is the mad person for them. Exactly. So it's just coming full circle to what you said. I mm. mean, he is like the mad guy around. Mm. Although he knows they're the ones who are mad. Mm. So, but he doesn't call them mad. They call him an idiot. But mm. he doesn't call anybody an idiot. Yeah. But he can see through his intellect, he displays his, his logic. Mm. And he wins most of the times. Mm. However, there is the concept of uh, that what was normal for that society mm. was being cr crazy by his standard. Mm. So they would regress back into their own normalcy. Right. So then again, we talk about, you know, society, when we're talking about the values of society and a, a specific dynamics, you can see them, they're global. Yeah. Uh, 
the element of hypocrisy. I mean, he's also dealing with that too. Absolutely, is. That when a person is not a hypocrite, when a person, uh, his heart is on their sleeve, yeah. they are perceived as being odd. Yes. They are perceived as being, well, you know, maybe that so-and-so is not, is not too f quick on the uptake. And uh, these things, why are they, you know, um, I, I read something on, on social media the other day where they said that uh, nowadays good manners and somebody actually being genuine comes across as, as, as so... Um, as the odd one out. As, exactly, and that you actually start asking yourself that why is this person being nice to me or why is this person behaving in this manner? So here we have society in general all carrying on in a specific way and then you get the odd one out. And so you get the odd one out who's actually a beautiful soul yep. but is labelled the idiot. As the, as yeah. the idiot. That, that's so uh, how tragic is that? It, it is tragic and, and, and that's the way and, and the biggest tragedy I would say is not that it, this happens but that this happens repeatedly. Repeatedly. Over the, I mean, since now, uh, you see, hundreds it's a, of years. It, absolutely. It's a question of value. It's, it's a question of the value system. Every society has its own value system. Now those value systems end up being based on passion, mm. on ego, on materialism, on worldliness, on, mm. on, on money and uh, on, on hoarding and stuff like that. That's what, the, what this uh, idiot is basically up against. He comes into the society, although he has the title of a prince, he's mm. not that rich, mm. but he has to deal with all of these things. And very quickly you see things uh, emanating from this interplay mm. because that society is normal by its mm. standards. He is normal by his standards, mm. uh, but he is abnormal by their standards. Right. And he's not there to change them, but he does try to help people. But mm. you can see the wave, the tempest of of, of, of a society overwhelm him mm. and then there's the it leads up to a murder and that murder is basically the culmination point of that book right exactly exactly okay we're going to take a short break right now but we'll be back don't change the channel Okay, welcome back to the program. We're talking about The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky and having a fabulous conversation. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's just so much to learn from a person so gifted, from a yeah. writer so gifted. True. And you, you were, you know, speaking about his solitary confinement before we went to the, to the break. Okay, so solitary confinement is used to break many a soul. people, yeah. break a soul as well. It's used as forms of torture, yes. it's used as forms of extreme punishment. What is it all about? Are we so afraid to be left alone with our thoughts? I, th I mean, I, I, since I wrote a book about the mind, I, th I think I can just uh, uh, touch upon this point because this is a huge question that you ask. I think the human mind is constantly vibrating. It's constantly coming up with ideas. Those ideas uh, have to be uh, extended into communication or into some kind of something. Uh, if, if they're kept inside the mind, mm. that's where it, the mind starts to uh, swell up mm. and eventually it explodes. That explosion is usually the break of the soul and the mind of the, and the body at the same time. Mm. In, in his case, we can clearly see that he was it was very, very clear to the authorities that they wanted to break him mm. they, and they wanted to teach him a lesson, mm. which was that from what we gather from historical records that the, 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 the police that was overseeing his solitary confinement, even they were wearing, wearing shoes that did not make any noise. Mm. So you can well imagine they were torturing him. Not the just amount of isolation they wanted to put him in. Absolutely. And if I can add, silence. 
They yeah. wanted to show him what absolute silence is so that his, his active mind was going absolutely crazy. But in, in his circumstance, his compatriots, I'm sure they went crazy, but in his circumstance, he at least, he survived. Mm. He had epileptic fits and mm. uh, he was in hard labor eventually mm. uh, or before, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly, but uh, he went through what could be a, a form of hell. Of course. And from that he came mm. out as a far more stronger mm. person who was able to deal with such difficult topics. Mm. And in, in this topic you have, uh, you have a person whose name is Prince Mishkin mm. and he comes back into society, his, mm. this, his, his own society, but mm. he's come back after being treated for epilepsy, mm. partially successfully, not completely. And he sees a society that has a different value system. He has mm. a different value system and they're constantly at odds. Mm. And he's constantly rebelling against them, not uh, sort and of not very consciously, su yes, absolutely. but unconsciously. Absolutely, and not very successfully, one might add, mm. because he doesn't have that aggression mm. to protect the mind. Now, I, I mean, I'm, the human mind is central to everything. I talked about that in my book. Mm. But the reality of life is that goodness has to be protected, hence, the mind has to be protected mm. and the mind and goodness when they have to be protected one has to understand the aggression of society mm. the aggression of crassness mm. now uh, why does crassness tend to prevail or appear to prevail because good people tend to back off and the crassness is not a, a, a virtue of the bad mm. uh, I mean I'm speaking in double inverse so mm. uh, crassness has it has been uh, riding the wave of entropy. Entropy mm. is a natural phenomena ordained by the Almighty. Mm. Everything has to go down at mm. the end of the day. Uh, stars are formed and stars die. People are born and then they move on to the next world. Uh, concepts come, concepts die. So the crassness has this really bad habit of riding the wave of entropy. That's how I look at it. Mm. And you see him trying to go against that crassness that because you see things progressively become more harsh in the book mm. which culminate in a murder and um, and exactly it's like he's uh, being squeezed in a vice from, from all corners all corners for, and, and he's just in the middle and he's helpless absolutely and um, you know he doesn't know exactly he, well, you know, he's trying to maintain a balance. Absolutely. And that's one of the really hard and, things and, to do. And, I mean, the, 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 you've, you've got the word balance. Now, when he starts to lose that balance, that's, that's towards the end of the book, mm. you can see how things start to go haywire mm. and, and how the crassness is there as it was before. Mm. He's the one Strong. who... Yeah, and he's the one who's squirming. Fluctuating. Yeah, between. fluctuating like a... He's swinging like a pendulum. He's mm. he's twitching like a, bur a fish out of water. Then he tries to be crass in in one scene, and then he, that ends up horribly. And then eventually, he's reduced to the level of a real idiot. Mm. That is the tragedy of the situation. So such a beautiful thing was not uh, given weightage by his own society, and that society just hammered him back to what they wanted him to be. Mm. And they didn't gain from him. Mm. They didn't understand. They understood him in bits and pieces, and some people appreciated him. But that was just not enough. And it also shows an inner weakness. Yeah. Being good is not enough. You have to be aggressive with it. You have to be strong. Yeah. And throughout the book, they're also laughing at him. Throughout, mm. and they, they, you, at times you come when you're reading the book because it's like a Russian book, and it really takes you into a lot of detail. You can see that. Uh, nature is observing, watching him. all these people interplay with each other like a, like a moving theater. Mm. And you can see that uh, they're waiting for him to come. Mm. Oh, him and his bright ideas, mm. him and his bright intellect. He's their source of entertainment. There you go. Absolutely. He becomes a source of entertainment, but then suddenly when things start to get very serious, he becomes a problem for them, mm. for some people at least. And mm. that's when the crimes of passion start to uh, rear their heads. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, the book is about a beautiful soul that mm. is brought up against a, a typical society. And uh, that's like, uh, there's this old adage, it's called uh, suffering, ignorance, and smiling. That's a very, very diluted, very um, reflection of what this book is about. Mm. However, 
um, it's beautifully handled by the by the author because okay, I do have a uh, I do like the author tremendously, mm. and he is m my favorite Russian author. But mm. uh, I don't think this could have been handled in any other way. Right, it, the intricacies Absolutely. behind it. Absolutely. Okay, we were talking about beautiful souls. We're talking about society. We were, you know, in the 1800s as well. I mean, this is something down to even before that as well, uh, where society was always brought forward in literature, many of the famous writers wrote against their elitist society, wrote against the society that actually they were, you sure. know, who were going to read them. Mm. Uh, and they pointed out their hypocrisies, they pointed out their moral double standards, and they, you know, spent a lot of time writing about that. The same thing, I wouldn't say we've moved on much. Uh, yes, we've moved we on. Haven't. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't, let's be in, fair, we fact, haven't. And uh. in fact, we may, you know, actually say that values have actually uh, we've, we're losing them because at that time in the Victorian era as well, in the in the um, uh, in the time of chivalry, in the time of when manners and all these things came into play, and uh, moralistic values were put at quite a high pedestal. You sometimes you you think that you know where is all this going and what has happened? Now, when we talk about a beautiful soul, goodness. Uh, the epitome of goodness, a person who comes into this arena and is, has everything thrown at them. You hear many people saying, you know, I started out life as so-and-so, such a, such a personality. True. This is how I was. But things have been so hard, and life has been so hard, that I've now put a shell around me, and I'm not as I was before. So. Um, Absolutely. Um, I think that that's the reality of life. I mean, we humans, whether we're Russian or Pakistani or uh, uh, American or Cambodian or uh, mm. Namibian, we're all the same. We have the same human nature. The basic set is the same. Mm. But our value systems, as you use that word value, well, I'm, because I think that's very important, the value systems of every society is slightly different mm. because every society has its own heroes, mm. has its own villains. Mm. Let's just, uh, if we deconstruct it from that perspective, um, that society is in every human society uh, goes down this path of entropy. Mm. Take us Muslims, for instance, we were known for our sophistication. Mm. Baghdad, you know, Persia, the Mughal Empire, and then mm -hmm. suddenly, because of various circumstances, we became animalistic, mm -hmm. and we—that's where the struggle lies. I mean, Europe was uh, in tatters. In the when, Dark Ages. Exactly right? when the Muslims were yeah. in, a, in a state of sophistication, mm -hmm. then they had their Renaissance, which was not completely, but partially influenced by the Muslims. I mean, yes. let's not steal their thunder, and they shouldn't mm -hmm. steal ours. So uh, that, that up and down thing happens in society, but what we, uh, to be able to capture those points, because um, the, the best way to capture those points is to look at value systems. Hmm. From my perspective, that's what Dostoevsky does. He looks at the value systems of a society and the value system of a person and how <clears throat> powerful people are able to bring their values onto society. Hmm. Now this is a political commentary as well. Hmm. Here in this book, Prince Mishkin is not strong enough to bring his value system mm. onto the onto the society, mm. like Trotsky and like Lenin and mm. like various others. They were strong enough to mm. bring their, but at the end, end but in, to to be fair, in a debate, they weren't exactly that nice. Mm. This Prince Mishkin is a. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to compare apples with apples. Mm. Uh, Prince Mishkin is a kind-hearted fellow who can't hurt a fly. Mm. So he's not going to survive for very long. Mm, so mm. you can well imagine what happens to mm. him. It's like throwing a, a very innocent babe in front of the wolves. Mm. And that's eventually what happens mm. because he succumbs. He cannot handle that thing. Mm. And, and it's, I think, important to, once we look at the value systems, we have to look at this story from f approximately four different perspectives. Mm. As a story, mm. as a conscience, mm. a discussion of the conscience, mm. as in allegory to uh, the Christian mindset mm. or also as a description of uh, a utopian person according to them because right. we must remind ourselves that Dostoevsky was a devout Christian mm. although I, I distinctly remember him mentioning Islam in his last book mm -hmm. The Brothers Karamazov 
Uh, just very briefly, if I can yeah. talk about that. As, as, as a story, we've discussed it as a story. It's mm -hmm. a person a pitted against a value system and how does he, how he, how, what happens in between. Mm -hmm. But as in, as, as in, uh, you can't help but think when you're going through the book that this is like the human conscience. Yeah. Because in this story, Mishkin ends up talking to people's souls, not to the bodies. Mm -hmm. People th first try to talk to him body to body, but then mm -hmm. suddenly he enters their mind. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, his strength, mm -hmm. and he doesn't realize this. And that's the, basically the basis of you know, real deep relationships, isn't yeah. it? I mean, absolutely. Once you, that's how you get close to someone. That's exactly. the real closeness. Mm -hmm. And you can see him talking to evil people. Mm. He, he, he's talking to their soul and mm. calming their soul down. And, and even he, breaking them down too. Yeah, and to a certain degree he's successful, mm. but only for a period. And then they'll revert to their... Because the crassness is constantly reminded to people. Mm. He doesn't remind them. He then moves on. So is it true that people don't change? A characteristic inherent since childhood uh, will not change. Is, is, is that something also I, that I the author is dealing with? He is dealing with it very successfully, and I think that is what he's saying. That you see, Mishkin does not let go of his. Uh, mm. When he does try to let go of his uh, nature, his mm. original nature, he becomes miserable. But then, at the same time, he's not strong enough to fight off the wolves, mm. and he succumbs. But at the end of the day, I dare say what you're saying is right because mm. we we deep down do exactly what we're programmed to do, what right. we want to do. Right. Um. What, another thing, you know, that I think, if we, if we look back in our lives and we look at personal experiences, not just ours, other people as well who are close to us, we may be able to identify that many things happening in life were where we were at a reactionary phase. And if maybe handled differently, they might have had a different outcome. Some of them not so good, some of them better, whatever. Now, you have written three books. One of your book is Mind Conquest. Yes. In fact, I would think that that is one of the biggest conquests of all. And you have also Absolutely. Uh, um, mentioned the animalistic behavior and how important it is to control that animal Absolutely. inside us. Absolutely. Please tell us about that. Um, Absolutely. I mean, uh, and just to give a disclaimer, I, uh, my book is nothing compared to what we're talking about mm -hmm. right now. It's just a brief mention. Uh, in, my, in my work, what, what I have uh, been able to see and understand is that you, can, you have to segregate the mind or you have to, separate, you have to define a mind. Firstly, the mind is central to everything in the, our existence. Now, when I say mind, uh, it is true that the heart is part of the mind, and they should be in absolute sy synchronicity with each other. But are they? They always it they're seems not. Like they're always at odds. They're to not. Each other. And, and, and to to give a medical fact, there are forty thousand neurons in the heart. That's why the heart sinks. That's uh -huh. why the heart feels depression, not the mind. So we'll come to that in a second. But uh, just just very briefly about my own work. Um, well, I thought the easiest uh, in my work, in my, uh, in my journey, what I realized was it, the easiest way to describe a mind is to differentiate, uh, to define it, is it reactive or is it reflective? Mm -hmm. They're totally opposite mm -hmm. and both can be the opposite. Mm -hmm. They can interchange. They can interchange uh -huh. uh, very, very easily mm -hmm. and due to circumstances. A reflective mind can become crass and mm -hmm. re reactive. Mm -hmm and a, a reactive mind can become reflective. Hmm. It is important for a, when societies are growing, uh, what I try to describe is that from an individual to a group, to tribe, to tribes, to, tri to, to nations, then to, to, to the empire, and then backwards. Hmm. When you're growing, you're reflective. You're, hmm. you, there's a whole plethora of you know, things like, you know, okay, you're pluralistic, you, you accept religions and ma many things. Mm. You accept people with different scare backgrounds. Mm. But when you become reactive, you stop accepting things. You just want things I immediately done in a particular way according to a value system. Mm. Uh, that's the way I describe it in my book. And of right. course, uh, I'm not going to even try to put that onto Dostoevsky, no, mm. no way. Uh, but what Dostoevsky does is basically he, he gives you a telescopic and a microscopic view at the same time. Mm. That's something that is not easy to do. Mm. 
-hmm. He gives you a microscopic and a telescopic view at the same time of the human mind, mm -hmm. human nature, and society. Mm -hmm. That's why his books tend to be so heavy mm -hmm. to digest. Absolutely true. And as we're talking right now, you know, how the actual, the actual responsibility of every human being regardless where you are in the world, to protect good Absolutely. and to fight evil mm -hmm. is one of the most uh, basic requirements that we need to achieve. Especially when you see so much negativity going around, when you see so many people who are actually, you, you know, in need of help, I would say. So those beautiful souls, you know, wandering around and in and, and, and such trouble, because of course, when you're in that phase, you also, you're very disturbed and you're very pained by things that you see yeah. going around. So um, the reflective versus the reactive, that, that's very, very important. In fact, in our society as well, to teach tolerance. This is something that needs to be taught in schools. This is something that needs to be brought up in colleges, universities. Yes, that is true. Look what happened in, in, a, in a university, it's at the cradle for education, where a young man lost his life due to... He was brutally murdered, let's be very frank. Exactly, I mean, he was based lynched. on absolutely on, uh, on personal things which were given a, an air of rel religiosity and that's exactly. uh, totally malified, totally so malified. So this is where you know, what you've been talking about in your book needs to be applied practically. How do we go around doing that? It, it's, uh, okay, um, uh, in, uh, with reference to our society, because, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't read a book and just uh, be emotional and sentimental about it, but I would like to juxtapose it to next to myself and our society because we have to think about the future. Mm. Um, we are basically a very tolerant country. This, we are one of the most least racist countries on earth. The UN study has defined this and to give uh, India its grading, its due grading, it's one of the most racist countries on earth. And I'm not saying that the UN is saying that. Okay. So we are typically a very tolerant and racially diverse country. Mm. We accept everything. Mm. However, ever, we've got some issues in our environment. Mm. Aside from the typical false flag issues where mm. people try to create sectarianism. Many that's things are politicized. Absolutely. Mm. But there are certain real things that we have to accept. First is we have economic difficulty. Mm. If people had more money, they would be more comfortable. They would be even more tolerant. Mm. They would be even more racially accepting mm. to other people. Mm. <coughs> If, if we had slight, slightly better day-to-day -day social administrations, mm. we, we would be in a much better situation. People would be more calm. They would be more relaxed. Mm. You see, uh, when there's plenty, people tend to be more tolerant. True. When there is plenty, people tend to be racially uh, accepting, pluralistic. And, and now, uh, isn't it a strange coincidence? Well, mm. it's not a coincidence, it's, it's a reality that the moment America, America becomes less lucrative for people to live in, mm. to be a citizen of, suddenly they start to become racially sensitive mm. because there's less to go around. Right. It's, it's, it's a very simple economic principle. Mm. And uh, coming back to Dostoevsky and ourselves, I mean, you see a pattern, a pattern of wealth Mm. versus the pattern of penury. Mm. People are poor, they react in a different way. They have their own ups and downs, animalistic natures, reflective mm. natures. The people it's who are, survival as well, survival skills as well, isn't it? They, are, they, they live for survival. They're not surviving to live. Mm. They're living for survival. How can so we that survive? that is going to bring out the animal instincts. Absolutely. Mm. Yet, when you compare that animalistic in instinct with the w the wealthy animal in in animalistic that's a totally instinct, different yes, th that's thing. what he talks about. He he mm. plays out these things because mm. the, the poor were not that animalistic or dangerous to begin with, mm. whereas the wealthy they had the power to do much more. When we bring it to our society, and I, I'll just briefly talk about Pakistan because that's extremely close to my heart. That um, being a you have to bring a society to a reflective mode. And for us, honestly, I'm, I can see the signs. Mm. It's not that difficult. We mm. just need to bring a few things in order, mm. like improving economic activity, just improving it. Mm. You don't have to be at the top. Mm. 
just to have social order mm -hmm. and to have just social justice and that's all you need the rest is just going to snap back into place mm -hmm. that's the, but we see for example when i compare our society with what uh, dostoevsky was talking about we see that there was a, 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 a significant lack of social justice mm. in their society that they talk about. I, I'm, I'm nobody to comment on whether it was wrong or right, mm. but what I believe in is that uh, that did play up constantly. Okay, well, is this socially just, mm. what just happened? The mm. poor people are being kept poor and things like that. So in a nutshell, I mean, uh, this was and still is one of my favorite books. Mm. And um, it deals with a very sensitive subject of human nature, mm. value systems. Mm. What happens when two value systems yeah. interplay with each other? Mm. And the unending battle between the heart and the mind and the mind itself. Uh, so many things uh, that we're talking about. Okay, the link between creativity and madness. Creativity, genius madness, you know, this triangle. Are they fueling each other? What exactly is it? Can I give a corporate answer to that? Because mm -hmm. um, I am a trainer and I, um, I tell my people, and, and it works like a charm, go crazy. Mm -hmm. If you have a crazy idea, mm -hmm. don't kill it. Mm -hmm. Just don't effectuate it. Mm -hmm. Just don't give it action. Uh -huh. Keep it on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. and you'll suddenly be less mad, the idea will be on a piece of paper, and you never know, something really good might come out of that crazy idea. So there has to be a healthy relationship. I, I, I think you, they're absolutely linked as you created that triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, they're absolutely linked. The only thing that I would say is that there are dimensions in which this thing flies. Mm -hmm. There is a bad dimension, let's just say, and then there's a good dimension. Mm. A bad dimension is where these things f uh, fuel each other, as you said, or uh, give food to each other, mm. as they said, or let's say they... They, 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 they live off each they other. They live off each other uh, in a bad way. Mm. But, but it can be done in a good way as well. Mm. But that requires a lot of mental management. Mm. You see, uh, being from the corporate sector, I mean, look, if, if I don't understand my mind, my, my, my juniors' is mind, my company's mind, my environment's mind, or my, then things are not going to work. Mm, mm. And, when I, if, and when I do understand the mind, my mind, you know, as I described, things become much, much easier. Mm. And I suppose, you know, when we're talking about that triangle of creativity, genius, and madness, the great works that were produced because of that, you know, let's call it madness of a kind, the internal <laughs> turmoil uh, for those artists, writers, poets, musicians, for them to come out with you know, great timeless compositions, paintings, works of literature, in some way that was uh, a soothing effect for them to be able to express what they were going through. I think that kept them sane. Mm. I think that kept them sane. Uh, I can't imagine if, uh, you see, Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky was not allowed to write or hear anything. Mm. That was his biggest punishment. It wasn't the solitary confinement. Mm. It was keep, keep those things inside mm. and which, watch what happens. We know you're intelligent. Mm. We'll just uh, give you a bit of hell. And what better hell than to leave you alone with your thoughts and not have any input or output? Absolutely. So they're just running riot inside. And that person tries to behave like a crass animal, but he mm, can't because he's just structured in a different way. Yeah. And uh, to give, uh, uh, I, I would like to sort of mention that the Almighty Allah, He gives everybody some talent. Mm. It's how we use that talent. Artists, can, they were inspired to draw something. Mm. Uh, being a genius, requires a lot of hard work, but it is, there is that element of uh, talent in it. Mm. And that might go crazy, might come up with something uh, fantastic, right. but they're all linked, as you said. Right. They're all linked. Uh, just briefly, as we're uh, running out of time, we're having a fantastic discussion here. What would you say you learned from this? And what would you like for other people to you know, pick up from? 
<laughs> one thing that still draws me to this book, which still, I mean, I, I first read this when I was 19. Lots of years have passed. Um, it's that goodness is right, but it has to be protected. Mm. As assiduously, as ferociously, as evil is protected by evil people. So true. And because, uh, because uh, my final point on this, I'll try to be brief, that good people are too fatalistic. They're like, yeah, I believe in the Almighty. I've done this and that. I'm good. So, you know, they just forget the uh, center part. The bad people, they're like, no, mm -hmm. I want this done. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get this done. I will change the environment to get what I want. Right. That is what the good people need to learn. Okay. If, if there's a good person, if there's a, in, in my second book, the, I, there's a term I came up with, which I actually practice. It's called angel hunts. Hmm. Not witch hunts, angel hunts. Okay. Go and find them. They'll be scared somewhere sitting. Ah. Find them in the corporate arena. They will be your angels, and they're always there. That's a beautiful thought. I really, really, I really, really like that term. Um, Fahim, uh, Mr. Fahim Sardar, thank you so much thank for you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, being here today in the studios to talk about a wonderful, a wonderful work of literature and uh, you explaining everything else. I'm sure you know, our viewers would have really enjoyed the program. Thank you so much. Okay, so we come to the end of a, a really, really interesting program. I mean, I, I really enjoyed s this conversation so much. Angel Hunt, I, I like that term. Let's all indulge in Angel Hunts. They're out there, they need our protection, just as our guest has been telling us, and uh, we need to bring out the angel inside of us as well. So let's all keep ourselves busy that way, and stay happy. See you next week. Bye-bye.